Water is fundamental to all life. Digestion, brain chemistry, drug metabolism, almost all biology, even if you can't see it, it has to take place in water. It's the most important liquid of life. So most of the time when people think about water, they think about it as this sort of magical substance where biology happens. It isn't until quite recently we really pay attention to what water is doing in biology on the atomic scale where everything's actually happening. Hi, my name is Sylvia. I run a research group at the University of Oxford in the Department of Biochemistry where we're trying to understand how water interacts with the processes of life. So what we're looking at is the structure of molecules in solution. So biomolecules, things like proteins or DNA, but importantly, we're looking at how the structure of molecules are hydrated by water in solution. So the difficulty with understanding water, especially in solution and on the atomic scale, is it's difficult to measure by most techniques. In many techniques, the water itself is invisible. If you take a protein as an example, pretty much every organism has proteins. They're sort of the working horses in our bodies. Your DNA code gives the blueprint actually to make proteins. So they're built from very long chains of building blocks, which we call amino acids, which fold up into these complex three-dimensional structures in order to function. And all of this, for the most part, takes place in solutions. But more interestingly, it has to fold in exactly the right way or it won't work. I mean, exactly. Somehow, your proteins in your body, in solution, fold into the same structure over and over and over and over again. But nobody really knows why. If you could understand the mechanisms that control the way proteins fold, you would have a, a very good way of, of trying to prevent uh, different forms of disease. My name is Alan, I'm an instrument scientist. I uh, do neutron scattering experiments on a whole variety of liquids and disorder materials. I mean, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, any of these diseases are almost invariably something to do with proteins not folding the way they're supposed to. And so there's been a huge debate going on about what interactions with the water cause the, these proteins to, to fold the way they do. So the current theory as to what water is doing in this process is that water is basically passive, that it's just this sort of magic medium where proteins fold up. I mean, traditionally the idea has been that the water forms like a shell around groups in the protein molecule, or what are called hydrophobic, they water-fearing, okay? So they don't like water being around them. Water doesn't like to form bonds with them. And the idea was, it was these hydrophobic groups that were pushing the protein into the structure that it had. Most of this theory is based on computation, which is a good thing, uh, but it needs to be experimentally verified. And so some of the work that we've been doing has actually shown that water is playing a more active role than previously has been thought. We think that it's actually doing things like providing a helping hand and allowing proteins to start that folding process, for instance. So we're using a technique that's more commonly used in physics to look at the structure of water around biological molecules in solution. And to do this, we go to the isis neutron and muon spallation source in order to do our experiments. Well, isis is a neutron source, obviously. Accelerate particles of protons, hits a heavy metal target, which then produces the neutron pulse by a process called spallation. We have a linear accelerator and then we have a synchrotron, which groups the protons together uh, into packets. Then we run them down and hit them into a target. And once they hit the target, they spallate. And those neutrons then come off. They're really fast, so we have to cool them down. So it's a process uh, called moderation. And then after moderation, we guide them in a collimator down to be uh, incident on our sample. We're firing neutrons at a sample, which is in solution, so it's in the liquid state. And they bounce off your nuclei and they interact with each other when they bounce off, and then they create a pattern which we can use to understand the three-dimensional structure of what's happening in our solution. So if you think about a molecule that's moving, right, you're gonna take individual snapshots here, 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 and here. So in a way, we can trap different bits of our protein in the process of folding. 
but at each stage we can see what the water's doing because we're building up a complex snapshot of everything that's happening. And then you can put it all together in a picture of how water's hydrating the molecule, how the different size of the change are and, and how far they are apart. But importantly, we're measuring on the atomistic scale. So we're seeing the atoms and how close the water atoms get to each other. I think the overarching theme that keeps emerging to us is that water really is being active. It's not just being passively excluded from a protein interior and then going about its own business. It's actually doing something. It has to be there and it has to be there to drive this process. So the water is acting as an intermediary between the hydrogen bond sites on the protein, on different parts of the protein, and it's pulling them together. That seems to be the picture that we're getting out of this. We don't see evidence for this so-called hydrophobic interaction. So if we're right about water-mediated processes and water has a quite integral role to biology, then this has pretty significant implications. It has implications for disease control, it has implications for designing better drugs, so drugs that actually hydrate in the right way so that they can map, for instance, the way hydration is in a place in the protein where the drug has to bind to in order to have its function. But we may not be right either. Okay, so this is the way sort of theories develop in science is that you have a th you, you take a set of evidence and then you come up with your best theory about that evidence and it works great until you get another piece of evidence and then it all falls apart and so you have to restructure your theory or modify it or just be proven wrong. I mean, I think as a scientist you're not really doing your job if you're not proven wrong at least once or twice in your career. But we're actually working on the edge of stuff and just starting to get new data. So it's not something that's old. We're actually pushing the boundaries of our techniques and the way that we think about things. And that's the fun part.